And here we are again at the Art Settlers of New York. My name is Raffaella Ronnie Bellini, and I'm here tonight celebrating the, uh, an extraordinary exhibit by a local New York settler, art settler, Roberto Ferreira. He is a multidisciplinary artist. And basically, we're going to have a conversation about the art that's being exhibited here at the Luisa Capetillo Gallery at Eminem's Media Community Center, no, also known as the Firehouse, Eminem's Firehouse Media Community Center, located at 175 East 104th Street between 3rd and Lexington Avenues. Uh, good evening, Roberto. Good evening. Thank you. Buenas noches. We are going to have, as I said, a dialogue about Roberto, the man, the father, the husband, the New Yorker, mm. and, um, and your interesting life. One of the things that uh, has impressed us here at m and with your work is your particular process. And we're going to be talking about that in a few moments. But when I when I saw when I saw your work and preparing for the you know for for this particular program, I thought about what you told me when you were a child, and w and one of our uh, favorite artists and yours as well, Pablo mm -hmm. Picasso, mm -hmm. once said, "All children are artists. Yes. The problem is how to remain an artist once he grows up." So, so talk to us a little bit about what happened to you. When did you discover that you were an artist? I remember I was uh, eight years old, somewhere around seven or eight, m playing with my brother, Fauci, um, on, um, in front of the house, actually in, in the house. My mother uh, was studying fashion design. She had illustration books. She had color books. And uh, I remember her working, sewing, and drawing, and my brother and I taking her pencils and sketching. And this was in the Dominican Republic. This is in the Dominican Republic. Mao Valverde. Valverde Mao. So yes. see, that, that's yes. where I was born. Um, so <clears throat> one day I remember we were using the pencils. And my mother, I think she was, she was uh, either cooking or something she was not around she comes back and she finds the pencils were almost gone <laughs> because we were sharpening them so my mother saw that and she said okay I think um, I'm going to get you some crayons and we had a 64 box of crayons which was like a Lamborghini of uh, of colors and uh, uh, so that was amazing and that opened up um, our um, curiosity to explore uh, the crayons at the time, which is the only medium that we had. I mean, besides clay, because all children play with, with mud, actually, in the backyard, so yes. So you come to the United States and you mm -hmm. settle in New York yes. at the age of 14. That's right. And um, what happened in high school? In high school, I, I, I went, there was a lot of racial tension in, uh, uh, in the school that I went to. Which is where? Uh, which is Martin Luther King High School. And I'm talking about 1989 all the way to 1992. So uh, there I, I um, biology became my major thing. I mean, I used to get 108 in the test, 109. And when I, when I, I remember having 104, and Mr. Petinji was my teacher, he goes, Roberta, what happened? And I'm like, I had 104. What are you talking you, about? You were brought up, uh, there was some expectation Correct. for you to become something else. What was Correct. that? Correct. Yes, my father is a doctor. He's a cardiologist. And my uncle is a, is a, was a urologist. Uh, there's a couple of doctors in the family on my, on my father's side. And uh, there was the expectation of becoming a professional doctor, a lawyer, or an architect, something like that. But, you know, I, I always liked to create. And I didn't know at the time what it was or what that meant for me um, until, I got to, until I got to college. Okay. And uh, what happened in, in college with respect to art? or science. Yes, because it's interesting you say that because uh, I started studying biology as a major. And um, uh, every student has to take art. When I took my first drawing class um, and my first painting class, 
my professor, Leopoldo Fuentes and Bill Benken, uh, both of them saw something that I did not. And they said, uh, they started guiding me and, and uh, a year or two later, I won a scholarship. It was my first co scholarship. There was another t two or three um, awards that I won. And that's when I said, okay, you know, maybe I should be a little bit more serious about this. And um, so that was the very first time in college that I decided to take that a bit more seriously. And what did your grandmother say? <laughs> <laughs> My grandmother, uh, she was a phenomenal woman. She was a leader. She was a madrona, you know. She was, uh, she was very uh, influential in my life also to become um, responsible for my ideas, right? Because she incurred um, security in, in me. Um, however, we were living in the house and we, I remember having the basement and I had my studio inside my room and, and outside in, a, in the round table. And when I won the awards, I came up to her and I said, Mama, look, look at this. And she, I remember she gave me a hug and all that. And then um, I said, I think I want to become an artist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was making plantains, you know, she was making fritos. And she goes like, well, um, if you want to do that, then um, you're going to have to figure it out. <laughs> because you can live with us, you can live in this house, but I think you should, uh, you should pursue something uh, that has financial, something, something that has mo more financial security. And I said, you know, but I don't, I think I like this better. I think this is where my heart is. Um, and she meant well, you know, she meant well. She came from from uh, the mountains of uh, in Venezuela and Biscucuy, and her father was uh, was in the. She had coffee uh, uh, fields, and she was hard work. Is very smart, and she wanted nothing but the best for us, just like every father, every mother wants for their children. They want the best, and I think that it was somewhat of a taboo subject. Uh, Pepon Osorio talks about this too. He says, you know, when I went to my family and I to tell them that I wanted to become an artist, it, it, it was forbidden subject. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of similar happened with my grandma. So I had to, um, I had to figure it out. And f it took me five years. It took me five years. And I just ended up moving and having my very first studio, uh, which was in Orloff in 238th Street at the Bronx. That was my very first studio. And that was while you were still in college? Or? I was uh, 25, yes. Mm -hmm. I was still in, in, in college. And then I decided, okay, so now that I'm, you know, that I'm on my own, I can pursue what I want. Now, um, you were somewhat sidetracked from art. What happened then? Yes, uh, between 25 and 30, it was Successfully. Very it, it was, uh, it was uh, 25 and 30 became uh, years of experimentation. Uh, in, in visually speaking, uh, and also intellectually. Um, but um, when I was 30 years old, I had my first child, um, Kai, and then I had Aiden and then Ian. So I decided to dedicate myself to my family. And uh, that was, uh, took 11 years pretty much to, to say, okay, um, I feel that I want to do what I, wanted to do in the first place so and that was to go back to finishing those seven classes that I needed to finish graduate and continue to pursue what I wanted which is uh, to continue with my career as an artist and um, talk to us about uh, what you were doing while you were raising your family what exactly were you doing professionally? I was traveling. I was a national educator and curator for the House of Creed, which is the second oldest family-owned fragrance house in the world. Uh, they've been around for 260 plus years, two and a half centuries, more than that. And uh, they were using really old methods. I was the, uh, the person in charge of writing the educational program. They did not have a marketing department at the time. So me and my brother Fauci were creating the graphic design works, the photography that was created. So I, besides uh, being an educator on the site, I also uh, did uh, the visuals for them, uh, some of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, um, of the graphic design used, the photography. 
So, um, and, and I started first in the United States, first locally, then United States, until by year number three, I became uh, the national trainer, but I was from, it, it was the territory was from uh, Canada to Mexico and from Puerto Rico to Hawaii. So I had a very large territory as an educator, and that's kind of where I discovered, you know what, um, this is uh, art and teaching. It's something that <coughs> seems right, but also um, I think it's time. And I started saving up uh, year number eight, I think it was, when I was in a company that decided to let me just save enough and until I have enough money until I'm ready. And uh, about a year and a half ago, I was ready, and, and here I am, uh, outliving my dream and outliving my vision. And that's, I'm doing what I wanted to do. That's, that's amazing. Thank you. And again, quoting Picasso. Yes. We're going to continue with him. He said, he says, uh, our goals can only be reached through a vehicle of a plan in which we must fervently believe and upon which we must vigorously act there is no other r route to success, and I think that you really accomplished that when you made when you made that decision. And it takes courage. Here you were successful, trying to raise a family, trying to raise three men, and you weren't around. How did how did how did that feel? Uh, the hardest sacrifice of being an artist is my family. I, I have to say that uh, that's that's the the most difficult thing, because. Um, here you are divided between two things that you really, really love, which is your immediate family, my wife, my, my children, my, my brother, my mother, and my art. And that is a conflict that has always existed in my life, and I think that will continue to exist. But I think now they understood the man. <laughs> they understood um, the, that I'm an ideas person, and that's what keeps me up at night. Sometimes I lose sleep because of ideas, and and sometimes uh, um, you know these are sacrifices that have to be done in order to continue to beat myself. Uh, in in uh, just to talk about uh, the quote on Picasso, it's you know I, I I didn't choose to to be an artist. It, it's just something that always was in the back of my mind, and always that came back either when I was in a restaurant in the plane. Sometimes I used to take the projectors into the hotel room and just move things around and just draw in my, in my room and put the do not disturb sign for five days because I, I just wanted to create. Well, certainly we, ha we have um, artists who are going to be watching, who are watching this program and artists uh, who are in our studio audience, you know, can certainly relate to that and understand that feeling. Those of us who don't create visually, um, perhaps, um, uh, are a little bit distance of that particular process, but it's but even those uh, who are into music or even performing mm -hmm. arts, you know, feel the same way. So you use different methods, and mm -hmm. uh, in terms of you, know, photography uh, right. that that we really want to talk about. But uh, this particular exhibit that you you decided to t entitle um, gentrified. Gentrified. Gentry fried. Yes. Como están frito. Sí. Right? <laughs> uh, let's talk about that first. It's Como están frito. Yes. Gentrified and dis displaced dist and gentry fried. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's a play on words. Um, uh, displaced is, th well, first of all, gentrification. The subject of gentrification is uh, something I was, uh, I, I was not planning to do that. I, uh, literally, I was just getting either getting uh, art materials in Harlem because City College is very close. It's where I go to to school. Um, it was right there, and and I I wanted to look for. I had to get materials at Blick right next to the Apollo, and as I was wa passing by, there were gathering of people. Were uh, they were they were talking about uh, gentrification, and on the sidewalk, we love we love to talk about that, particularly in this community in East Harlem about gentrification. <laughs> So I, I, I saw on the sidewalk, it says, we are, we are not Soha, we are Harlem. And there was a woman next to me, I started talking to her about her experience, and she goes, you see, that, that was my building right there. Now I have to commute, I had to leave because the rent went up. Now I have to commute all the way from Park Slope to here to see my friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I was moved by that. 
And then I said, I think I found my subject. Um, so I created this camera. Well, talk, talk about this camera. This camera is uh, is called a camera obscura or the pinhole camera because the aperture is created with with a needle. So therefore, the name pinhole. The light goes in through there, and is the image is recorded on a photo paper inside. Um, and and a Dutch master correct. used this. Correct. Was, uh, Vermeer. Vermeer. Yes. yes. Um, and and in fact. Uh, most of the Renaissance artists used not exactly this camera, but a kind of a prototype of w it was like a wooden box with a magnifying glass inside where the exterior world would be recorded inside and then being projected and reflected on a piece of glass and that's how they would draw so realistically. Uh, when it comes to Daguerre, uh, we're talking about early 1800s, 1820, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Daguerre was one of the first to, to use uh, uh, emotion and to create uh, a, a more successful uh, camera obscura, uh, followed by William Talbot Fox and, and the other innovators, and, and then the explosion of photography occurs. Um, so in 2018, I'm using a technology that goes back to 1820. I, I wanted to make a connection. I, the dialogue for me was, why am I going to use this camera for gentrification? And I found there was a similarity between gentrification and colonization. There was something that Can was. Can you explain that? A little well, bit more? I, w when you're when you're colonized, right? It's, it's against your will. Okay. Um, when you're gentrified, it's against your will. It's, it's some th that dialogue. There's something similar there, and I felt that the camera being an old world tool but using a contemporary subject would be was the key element that I needed to create my images. Um, uh, the images uh, I ended up making over a hundred images out of which f probably 54, 55 were successful and uh, well successful because everything in the end, I, I use everything. Um, so the, the images that you see here um, were, were some of those. Um, um, and, uh, and then, uh, um, yes, so gentry fried, that's the feeling that you get when, uh, when the big landlords and the big uh, bulldozers come in to destroy the area that you have a connection with your childhood. And that's what happened to that lady. And then this placed well, it's what happens uh, when you don't have any options. You, you're, you're shifted out of your comfort zone. You're shifted out of your childhood memories. And uh, I, I found out that this was also a word that was, uh, that was, uh, it was a city, I, I believe it was a fictitious city in Dante's Inferno when I was looking up at the word. Uh, not that it has anything to do with, <laughs> with Dante's Inferno, but I just thought it was uh, interesting to... Um, to that the word itself made a connection with that. And I was like, okay, that's kind of interesting uh, how, uh, how um, the word can have multiple meanings. Uh. So, so what's interesting is that even in your own transformation as, an, as uh, Roberto the child who used to draw yes. imaginative, imaginary characters, and caricatures, right? Yes. Uh, is now utilizing art as a vehicle for social justice issues. Correct. I, I believe that every artist, uh, no matter the medium, has a responsibility with their community. Um, you know, I, I, I create, my, my work is, is explores contradiction and explores... Uh, um, um, Conflict conflict and, and, and I felt that this was a, a, a concept that I could give back to my community to create awareness and hopefully you know to inspire someone to continue with dialogue or create a new dialogue. Um, we as artists are inspired but we also inspire and I think that's important to continue with the, with the conversation and um, so that was my responsibility. I felt that I had to do something about it. I was inspired actually with one of my professors, uh, Jasmine was Ramirez. Ramirez. Uh, was uh, Jasmine Ramirez. Uh, I took a class with her. And, um, in, and, in, and we were talking about social issues in the, um, in the, in the Latin American community. And, and it was around the time 
of these photographs. Right. Mm -hmm. We won't have time to discuss now the, the issue of the term, when you say Latin community, yes. you know that now it seems that scholars are using this neutral term Latinx, um, <laughs> because we want to get into um, uh, some of the images we have here and yes. certainly talk about the ones that you have at the Luisa Capetillo Gallery. Um, if you can look at the one that, that uh, says Peligro, talk to me about that particular image. Uh, that image uh, was created. I, I uh, took a picture uh, on my way to school, took a picture of a bulldozer. I wanted to incorporate the bulldozer in, inside uh, uh, in, in the composition. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a panel of seven so far. There's seven panels right now, and it continues to grow. Um, so far, there's seven panels. There, there are four panels here, and uh, the one that says Peligro, it uh, shows uh, um, this, this yellow geometric abstract um, bulldozer with uh, there, there are pieces uh, that seems to be broken up. And, and, um, and uh, the, the people normally come with asking questions, expecting answers. But the fact is that I had no, I don't have answers. I have more questions. <laughs> It's it's because that's what artists do. I I question things, and that's how the work is is created. So the questions here were: which are the elements that I can use to incorporate in the image to provide enough information without giving too much? And I felt that uh, the bulldozer was one. Uh, the 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 houses which were cu cut up. I cut up the images and then I decided to place them as if they were rubble. So almost, uh, you know, there's a, a lack of, uh, a lack of um, um, sensitivity when the bulldozer comes and it's like <laughs> and just rolling out all the houses. So they're not only rolling out uh, and destroying uh, concrete, they're also destroying history and, and emotional attachment to and your people. neighborhood and people <laughs> and, and that's, that's the, that's the sour part about gentrification. And uh, you have another image of um, these images here. Yes. The, that you use photography a lot in your work and you're, you're meshing your photography and other, fo and, and other forms uh, of um, techniques. This one here that's next to you, is this one, did you utilize this particular camera? Correct. Yes. This is a uh, this is a pinhole camera made of cardboard, uh, Velcro, and soda soda uh, can um, and tape. So soda cans. Soda cans. Well, everything like is recycled. Like drink and yeah. Yes. Okay. The only thing that I purchased was the tape and the Velcro. So that okay. cost me like three dollars and fifty cents, three dollars eighty cents. Um, and um, so I created. I decided to create a, a landscape type of uh, uh, image because I, I was interested in in in, in creating um, uh, double not double exposures but multiple exposures this camera has seven exposures so seven points where the light comes in to record the images so although it looks like um, uh, the images are all on top of each other but it takes me approximately half an hour to plan everything. And when I'm ready, then I release one of those numbers. That's where I just lift that. And that's where the camera records the light. And then you say it records a certain area. <laughs> and then now that I have, I have to remember what was on the window number four in order to combine it with window three and window four and window one, sometimes opening all of them at the same time, sometimes cutting the exposures to create multiple exposures in one single uh, um, um, aperture. And, and that's how these images were created. The weirdest thing about this camera is that no one knows what it is. <laughs> so sometimes uh, security used to come uh, when there were uh, uh, marches and, uh, and protests. Security would come thinking that this is a bomb. It's like, what? What yeah. is this, sir? I have mm -hmm. to ask you, what are you doing? 
this is a black box and then you know you're looking you know a little strange here so <laughs> you know talk so about when xenophobia when you were <laughs> documenting say a right. protest mm -hmm. i mean did you bring the the tripod with you or no. you were just carrying that right yeah, I that's once it once very threatening <laughs> right <laughs> once you have the cam once you have the tripod then there's an association that this is a camera. Right. I was not interested in calling attention. I was interested in recording what was happening at the same time without anyone knowing absolutely anything. So sometimes if I wanted to shoot this way, I would sit facing that way, release, opening like this, shoot that way, and then put it back. So that way the people that I wanted to take a picture of did not realize that they were being photographed and that's what happened on that picture right there which is on Riverside and 145th. This one is actually also 145th and this is a Betorillo that I took a picture of and, uh, and that one is also 145th by the river and there's a lady there uh, because uh, it records the images very slow you don't see people in them and it's extremely rare to see a person as sharp as that one because she was on her phone talking for approximately three minutes and she did not move at all. And that's why here on this image, there's people passing by. And the way you can tell is this, uh, there's, there's, there's light that is recorded um, in space and th that was a person looking at the cell phone. And that's how you identify the people. What, what, other what other art forms are you working right now or have you? Right now mm -hmm. I am working with Decay I am working with uh, dematerialization, basically that's uh, taking the material and transforming the material to discover new possibilities. I am also exploring natural dyes and uh, I'm using, I'm creating my own litmus paper, which is uh, creating images that basically fade over time. Very interesting. Uh, this is extremely yeah. experimental media. I had never used it before, but the program in which uh, in, I, I go to City College and right. and that's uh, they they push you to create s uh, medium that you have never used before, mm -hmm. and that's exactly uh, I'm I'm loving the program and extremely grateful to my well professor. Well, um, this segment of the Art Settlers of New York, we're very happy that we had Roberto Ferreira here with us today and thank you Roberto and we hope to see you again in the very near future and we wish you the best uh, in your career. Gracias Rafaelina, ha sido mi placer.